Um, and currently I'm joining you all virtually from the ancestral, traditional, and unceded territories of the Musqueam, Tehotmish, and Tsleil-Waututh First Nations. For me, as a first-generation settler um, who's lived and learned on these lands my entire life, and as someone who thinks a lot about this place that we live, I think it's especially important as we collectively dream about the future of our city that we acknowledge and speak to the harms, and, uh, the harmful colonial practices that have had and continue to have um, uh, an impact on planning and our city, um, and that we also root the teachings, traditions, and values of the First Nations on whose lands we reside in our present and future planning decisions. I invite us all to reflect and commit to holding truths about the past, even if uncomfortable, while we also center and uplift Indigenous voices and reimagine or deconstruct harmful systems for the present and the future. Um, the VCPC would also like to take this opportunity to acknowledge and celebrate Black History Month. To us, in the theme of understanding the past to dream about the future, this means elevating Black histories, knowledge, and experiences, and celebrating Black excellence. We acknowledge that we all face the challenge of forgetting our history, including the colonies that became colonial Canada, did so through land speculation, uh, colonialism, and more than 200 years of slavery. This ended only 30 years before the United States of America wrote the 1863 Emancipation Proclamation. And this proclamation gave the legal basis to free enslaved people of African descent, many of whom would subsequently over years form multiple generations of black freedom seekers to Canada, including to the city of Vancouver within the now displaced Hogan Valley community. It's within this context that we acknowledge the history of stolen lands and stolen people forced onto this land. We also recognize the United Nations Decla Declaration that we're um, in the International Decade for People of African Descent um, from 2015 to 2024, a declaration that acknowledges that people of African descent represent a distinctly recognizable group around the world and here in Canada whose human rights must be promoted, protected, and recognized. The VCPC and its commissioners heed the call to not forget the contributions of Black African descended members of our nation, our province, and our city, and the uncomfortable truths that this recognition creates within us all. We also finally commit to not forgetting this history um, into every day that we conduct our work as knowing the past opens the door to our collective future. And that idea of knowing the past opening the door to our collective future is the basis on which the VCPC continues to lead the chronology project. Um, and that's led to this annual event tonight. And you'll be hearing much more about the chronology work shortly. And the mandate of the Planning Commission is to advise the mayor and council on topics relating to the future of the city. On a broader level in our role as conveners of dialogue, we provide and support space for thoughtful conversations about how our city is evolving. These dialogues bring out ideas for what we need to pay attention to as we look to the future to help us make choices that guide our evolution in a direction that leads to a just, equitable, decolonized and inclusive city. Um, now I'd like to introduce, and I'm trying to see if he's here with us. I don't think he, um, Yuri, his counselor Pete Fry um, joined us. I'm not seeing him. I know that there's a public hearing tonight, so the timing was um, tricky, but perhaps Councillor Fry will be joining us later. Um, Councillor Fry is the um, uh, liaison to the, to the Planning Commission um, and was going to offer some welcoming words if he was able to get away from a public hearing, which it looks like that might have not been possible. Um, but so with that, I'll pass it off to um, our Chronology Committee member and former Commissioner Marta Ferbog to get us started for tonight. Thank you, Veronica. On behalf of the Planning Commission's chronology program, I would like to take a few moments to briefly describe the chronology. I've been involved with the chronology program since it started, including instruction of a UBC course at the School of Architecture and Landscape Architecture in the spring of 2014, where the students researched and uh, identified the initial set of milestones. For those of you who visited the timeline online, you will note that the first entry is an acknowledgement of the presence of indigenous communities of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh for over 10,000 years. The events we focused on in the past and which are chronicled on the website 
tell the story of post-contact planning and development. As the project develops, it is our intention to also enhance the chronology, both by adding entries on the pre-contact story of the uh, Squamish, Musqueam, and tsleil communities, and also by reviewing and uh, being thoughtful about the uh, items that are already posted to make sure that um, the post-contact entries include the indigenous dimension of Vancouver's planning and development story. We also look forward to partnering with our fellow advisory group, the Urban Aboriginal People's Advisory Committee. I'd like to introduce the members of our committee, Commissioners Karen Krangle and Yi Jen Wen, past Commissioner Leslie Shea, current Executive Director Yuri Artebis, and past Executive Director Elizabeth Ballantyne, and our volunteers, Jessica Jang and Grant Duckworth. The chronology program started with a conversation following a roundtable with commissioners in 2014. And it was identified that although there are many excellent histories and useful chronologies about the city of Vancouver, there wasn't a reliable chronology that focused on planning and development. So we set out to develop one. In the simplest form, we wanted the chronology to be a definitive list of Vancouver's planning and development milestones. A milestone being defined as a significant or transformative landmark event. We established criteria and set out to uh, form the chronology and to update it on a regular basis. And this is now, I think, the fifth year that we've had this year in review panel. 2020 is a unique year. We've all been struggling with uh, the results of the pandemic and it's had quite an impact on the city council and staff and a great deal has happened uh, in response to the pandemic. We have met uh, regularly to review uh, what's going on in the city. And we have identified a number of uh, potential milestones that um, we will review over time. And it will only be uh, with the passage of time that we know whether a milestone has significance or whether it was just a flash in the pan. This event is an occasion to review the past year's planning and development events to talk about them with people who are involved in uh, making them happen and uh, to uh, continue this process of updating our chronology. The list of milestones was tested at a workshop in December where a group of urban thinkers and doers in the city uh, got together, looked at the initial list and uh, through that process, seven milestones were endorsed. These have been set to the panelists who um, were asked to think about them as part of their preparations for the panel. And they're also available on our website. After tonight's discussion, uh, these emerging milestones will be listed uh, for a while on the online uh, listings. And in five years, will be uh, reviewed to see if they can be added permanently to the timeline. There are some links in the chat that will uh, connect you to the online resources. And a few housekeeping things before we get going. Uh, there's a video recording being done tonight and transcripts uh, will be available on the VCPC and Chronology websites. We have closed captioning for um, people who require that. And uh, there's a link at the bottom of the Zoom bar for that. We have uh, the chat room open and uh, we hope that people will take the opportunity to put their comments there. And that transcript will also be saved and be part of the documentation for tonight's events. Uh, we, we also invite people to um, use the question and answer function to uh, place questions of interest for the panelists. And we'll refer to that later in the um, evening. If you want to use Twitter or Instagram tonight, the hashtag is uh, milestones2020 and the handle is at BCPCBC. BC. Now I'd like to turn 
things over to our moderator. And we are delighted that uh, Francis Vila has agreed to take this uh, job on tonight. Everyone knows Francis. Francis has written um, extensively and for years about the urban issues that affect our city and BC. And uh, she's covered everything from the downtown east side drug addiction problems to billion dollar development projects. And she writes for the Globe and Mail, BC Business and Vancouver Magazine. With that, I'll turn it over to Francis. Thank you. Thanks, Marta. Um... Everyone can hear me okay, I hope. Uh, oh, my video got turned off. I don't know who did that. And I can't turn it on. Someone has turned off my video. Uh, okay, here I am. Okay, so um, thanks. It's very fun to be part of the, oh, Alex, that was very exciting. Um, uh, to be part of this. I think I came to the first one um, that you organized and a couple of others after that. And then I've been out of commission for a while. So it's great to be back. Uh, and um, I'm looking forward to the discussion on this. Um, you know, this is meant to sort of uh, temper the suggestions um, that have been put forward, maybe add some new ones. Uh, maybe talk about eliminating some. I'm not sure I'm waiting to hear. Uh, but this is really a place for us to think about um, when all of us are 30 years older, uh, and I hope we all make it. Um, you know, as we look back at 2020, what will we say? How did this year change Vancouver? I think we don't totally know yet. I mean, all of you are urbanists, so you've read all the stories I have about people speculating how 2020 is going to change cities. Um, offices uh, are going to empty out, downtown districts are going to empty out, everyone's going to move to the suburbs, uh, all the rest of it. So that may be added later on. Uh, it's not on this year's list, uh, but you know, I wouldn't be surprised if it comes up as people examine um, the ideas that have been put, put forward and maybe add some more. Um, so the planning commission is going to sort through everything that happens here tonight and sort of decide, uh, you know, um, how to integrate that into the list. And then the final uh, milestone contenders will be published online along with background information. And just, um, uh, I assume everyone here is a keener, but just in case, I'm just going to repeat what the seven uh, milestones for 2020 were identified as. So you know what we're talking about, um, and you might have some thoughts of your own as it comes to the audience questions, which we're going to get to later about, you know, things that could be added to the list. So the current list is the city's climate emergency response plan, the 371 page report um, that went to council um, before Christmas um, and um, has a lot of recommendations about reducing traffic, reducing fossil fuel use, um, improving building efficiency and so on. Pu number two, public space reallocation, which is uh, a lot of what's happening with closing off of streets, allowing patios to be created, and closing off of streets for sitting, because there's other types of closing off streets. Um, number three, uh, something I've really appreciated, the online city hall, which has allowed a lot more people, I think, to um, participate in public hearings and meetings at the city. Um, Number four, downtown public spaces for people strategy, um, which I assume is partly what's going on with the Vancouver Art Gallery, but um, everyone can weigh in. Um, Black Lives Matter, number five, um, which uh, produced, you know, significant street protests in Vancouver, um, you know, a blockade of the Georgia um, viaduct at one point. Uh, and I think uh, sort of a heightened awareness of everyone in the city who often thinks Vancouver doesn't have a black population that maybe it does actually have one. Um, number six was uh, the temporary shelter for street um, sex workers. Um, lots of new shelters created this year of different kinds because of the pandemic, but this was um, quite an unusual one. And finally, the slow streets 
uh, which all of you uh, will have forever printed in your memories, the orange plastic barricades saying slow down or I can't remember quite what it is, but they're everywhere sometimes pushed to the side of the road, sometimes left in the middle. So those are the seven. Um, I am going to um, introduce the panelists. Uh, and I think if it's okay with everybody, I'll only introduce, talk about the person who's about to speak. I won't do all four at once because I'm tired of my voice already. Um, so uh, Antonia, uh, very kindly offered to go first out of the four to give her reflection. So Antonia Ogundele is a, a trained urban planner um, and resilience professional. She was a member of uh, Falls Creek Stewardship Committee, which was a committee that was very much involved in reimagining Hogan's Alley, um, a, a, an original, very important um, geographic center of the Black community in early um, Vancouver up until about the 1940s and 50s. Uh, and um, that uh, has evolved into the Hogan's Alley Land Trust and, and Society. And, you know, there's a lot of conversation still going on about that um, uh, particular effort uh, with, uh, you know, some, some friction, I would say, between the society and the city about what actually is going to happen in that area. Anyway, I'll let Antonia go ahead and speak to our planning milestones of 2020. Go ahead. Hi, good evening, everyone, and thank you so much for the opportunity to share. I believe I have five minutes to give some very quick reflections on the seven um, milestones. I'm, uh, I'm just, again, really glad that I have this opportunity to reflect back on 2020 in this way. Um, because 2020 for me, and I think for a lot of people and families, um, and as a mom, um, was really about survival. And so if you see my daughter pop in and say she wants a snack, do not be surprised. I may or may not turn into a cat. That's also something about 2020. Um, but uh, really, I'm I, I'm going to kind of just go through and and talk about some of the some of my thoughts on each of them and some of the pieces that I think could or should have been added. Um, the climate emergency action plan um, was I I definitely agree that that was a, a huge milestone. Um, and within the context of the being. Um, you know, in our homes uh, and seeing what happened last year, Vancouver, the West Coast was on fire. And so it was more, more than appropriate for um, that particular plan with its big moves to, to go through. So I, I um, definitely reflect that that was a positive, uh, a positive thing. Um, the other piece there, uh, the next one is around Black Lives Matter. Um, and I know for myself and other members of the Black community, it was an extremely exhausting and tiring year. And I would actually re, re, um, rewrite that as Black Lives Matter in urban planning. It was the first time where, where the conversations around equity became no longer this kind of side conversation or out of scope of major planning decisions, but actually were on the table. Um, so I would even draw back to the call to courage that was uh, produced by Jay Pitter last year that really was, that really spoke to this equity lens that needs to be included in terms of our urban planning decisions. And it was also this really weird time in terms of the planning profession where I, I did see people kind of rubbing their eyes and saying, oh my goodness, I didn't know that this was a problem despite that this work has been happening for many, many years. Um, and it's unfortunate that it was under, again, the, the pandemic, um, George Floyd, uh, the, uh, the murder of George Floyd that uh, that, that realization uh, was, um, what was actually uh, experienced. Um, I would say that in 2020, the social contract was on the table. Um, so that the foundation in which planning decisions are made had completely changed with the enactment of the Emergency uh, Program Act. Um, and so the dreaded noise bylaws go out the window uh, when we start making noise uh, at seven o'clock, you know, or that we were able to think about emergency housing uh, as well. Um, that uh, emergency housing and, and looking at homelessness as something that needed to be addressed immediately in the context of the pandemic. Um, I really uh, didn't, 
when it came to kind of the public space reallocation, slow streets um, and places for people strategy, um, I didn't give way too much, a lot of thought into that because um, I was really into kind of the bigger, like those, those big meaty social pieces that actually have now, I think, pivoted and shifted the way that we are making um, these, uh, these planning uh, decisions. Some things that I think were on here in terms of uh, that, that are missing, which is really hard to kind of pin down. Um, oh, actually, no, I'm not gonna go to that. I'll talk to that after, but the clearing of Oppenheimer Park was a huge moment last year. And that said a lot about the, the, the big decisions that council is, in, is not making around addressing these issues of homelessness. Um, I think everybody in the city grieved that, or I would hope that people grieved um, what was happening in those circumstances and continues to realize the need for uh, equitable that there should just there should just be housing. We should address it like the uh, the emergency that it is. Um, and so the ones that I was saying that are hard to pin down are the little decisions with the big impacts. It's usually the little small rezonings, the permits, small planning approaches that are um, that actually have these cumulative really big decisions. I like I am sure other people uh, as well, which I, and and you know uh, Francis, you um, insinuated as much that. There's lots of movement around the city. I moved from downtown into East Van um, and, uh, and, and remain gobsmacked at the fact that these massive single family homes continue to be built on the lots of massive single family homes. I saw Vancouver this summer um, as, with my, my, my daughter and my husband. Um, when you try and find things to do, you go around the city and it was actually the first time I had gone to Southlands and that was a complete shocker to me. Um, when we again talk about this emergency around homelessness and, um, and planning indecision when it comes to addressing really the, the housing type that we are prioritizing and also who we are um, valuing, uh, who, who we value um, in, in terms of uh, housing in our city. Um, I spend a lot of my time um, at the intersection of physical and digital space. Um, I'm the founder of Ethos Lab, which is um, a, a youth a youth uh, academy that is endeavoring to provide access to emerging technologies, tools, resources uh, to young people. And I would say with one of the pieces here in terms of virtual council meetings, yes, a lot of people were online, but a lot of people, particularly uh, racialized, marginalized communities could not find themselves online. And I found that that was the space that I was occupying and trying to find different ways to engage young people in particular um, in a way to still feel connected and less isolated. I think that that is what is actually glaringly ice, um, missing from here is the extreme mental health crisis that we're going through also. I, I mean, we could talk definitely about the opioid, opioid crisis, but as a parent and hearing what's happening in the schools and with other young people, um, there, uh, there's some massive indecision around making sure that we address that from a planning perspective, whether it be providing different infrastructure or opportunities for them to engage, it def and definitely um, noticing the digital divide. Um, and so that is kind of my starting point to all of these reflections. It, it kind of went up, down, sideways, and around, but I think um, ultimately, uh, this is the first time I'm reflecting on these seven milestones because for the last year, I've been just trying to get by. <laughs> so uh, I hope that uh, I hope that that starts the conversation. Yes, um, and I good to emphasize uh, try, the trying to get by, um, which I think has been a bit more challenging for some than others. I don't have children at home anymore, thank goodness. I don't know how people with children are doing it. Um, so our next reflector is going to be, um, thank you so much. And thanks by the way, Antonia, for mentioning your company, which I meant to uh, um, say in the introduction. So uh, that's good that you talked about it. Um, so our next speaker reflector is Alex Boston, who is the executive director of SFU's Renewable Cities Program. And he has two decades of experience in climate and energy policy planning and engagement. 
and he's worked with governments, real estate developers, utilities, university think tanks, municipal associations, and nonprofits. But you need to add resident groups to that, I think. Um, so I'm interested to hear what your thoughts are on the seven goals, the missing 500 others, um, or milestones, I should say, the missing 500 others. Go ahead, Alex. Thank you. Thank you so much for the opportunity and creating the space for this important conversation. Yuri, if you could bring up that slide deck, and I'm super compromised. I'm working off my smartphone because I wasn't able to access the link. So Yuri, when I hit, raise my highlighter, just advance the slide deck. Um, and uh, I can see you, uh, Francis. Is that slide deck up? Not yet, no. Not yet. Um, okay. Yuri I'll needs to share on. the screen and do that. I'll just keep on talking uh, until it comes up. And I'm really going to focus on the Climate Emergency Action Plan. And 30 years from now, when I'm not alive, uh, but other people are reflecting on 2020, potentially the Climate Emergency Action Plan won't be acknowledged. But one thing I think will be acknowledged are some of the huge uh, policy uh, watershed moments that have come out of it. And Yuri, if you could advance the, the next slide. This was a really substantive and thoughtful intervention as uh, Francis underscored over 300 pages in, in, in volume. And I want to, in this presentation, talk about the importance of this milestone and the keystone elements that are in it. One thing that's really critical is that when Vancouver passes a milestone, often it goes far beyond its borders. And a real centerpiece of the Climate Emergency Action Plan is the work on the zero emission uh, building plan. And it is changing workplaces across British Columbia, the other side of the Rockies, right out to Nova Scotia and south into the United States. And it's a transformative market-based uh, approach to getting to net zero buildings by um, 2030. And it's really having a huge impact. Next slide. I don't wanna, I really wanna focus on an, a couple of areas that are really novel um, contributions that this plan made that isn't happening largely across the country and in other uh, parts of the United States. And that's the big policy discourse change around land use and affordability and equity. There's not been, if you could advance the next slide, uh, Yuri, there's, there's a chasm that exists between land use equity and affordability. And this plan really drove those priorities centrally into it. I say at this point in time, they really exist exclusively as high level uh, um, policy markers. They don't currently exist in terms of the, the policy minutia that's gonna change things on the ground. We're now several slides behind. behind. Yuri, if you could advance to that slide that is called, um, I think it's called Hollowed Out Homes and Hidden Housing Solutions. And what we have to begin to do is really advancing deep integration opportunities. If we look across the city of Vancouver, 40% of households um, have, are occupied by only one person. 30% are occupied by two people. Over 70% of the city's households are, are occupied by only one or two person homes. This is an astonishing figure. And uh, it underscores one of the reasons why we have this acute sense of social isolation that's really come to the fore during the COVID pandemic, but has been simmering away in the background. It's most acute amongst young people and amongst uh, seniors, but it's right across the spectrum. And the fact that we have so many one and two person households is a challenge, but it's an, also an opportunity. It costs several hundred thousand dollars to create a single social housing unit. We should be developing programs to facilitate home sharing and secondary suite management on behalf of seniors. Seniors have unique barriers to uh, becoming a home share host or managing a secondary suite for a whole variety of reasons. On $100,000, 
we could be creating 50 or 60 or 70 uh, affordable housing units in the form of a home share or in the form of a secondary suite. And these are triple word scores. They advance affordability, they address social isolation, you double the, the occupancy in a, in, a, in a home and you reduce per capita greenhouse gas emissions by half. Next slide. Housing and, and transportation deep integration. We're stepping on opportunities all over the place and not capitalizing them for advancing uh, affordability. The second biggest expenditure when it comes to uh, people's average um, basket of goods over the course of a, of a month is transportation, housing being not number one. And one of the biggest opportunities is stacking affordable housing units on SkyTrain stations, on bus interchanges, on bus depots, all sorts of vacant land that we have out here. This is, this is uh, 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 um, Oak Ridge development, the lowest development, the lowest building that you see there is a SkyTrain station. It's actually tucked behind. You can't even see it, it's so small. There's no reason that that shouldn't be um, market rental or uh, affordable rental or social housing units or a combination of market and social housing units. This is a huge opportunity. Moreover, it's also a revenue generation opportunity for TransLink even by providing uh, social housing units. Next slide. Um, and these, these, these opportunities really exist all over the place. Uh, in the right-hand side there is the Portero Yard in San Francisco. This was a, an average de bus depot, like the, the, Mar the Marpole Depot that's been uh, uh, imminently upgraded. Next slide in order to accommodate the battery charges for their new uh, electric bus fleet, you typically have to um, put, uh, elevate those, those chargers so you don't lose any land in the yard. Well, as well as uh, suspending from the ceiling of a new multi-story affordable housing development right on top of the bus depot, um, they, they, they uh, um, created this wonderful project in downtown San Francisco that really takes uh, into account all of these opportunities in terms of generating vitality, affordability, and also cost effectively uh, being able to uh, facilitate the electrification of their fleets. We need to start thinking in a much more integrated manner. Next slide. The one of the major controversies in the Climate Emergency Action Plan was mobility pricing. As we look around the world at any jurisdiction that's making any headway in driving deep emission reductions in the largest and fastest growing sector, which is transportation, mobility pricing is part of the solution. And it's absolutely critical that we advance this. I think there's a problem fundamentally with a cordon-based approach that was proposed by the by the city. It's the standard approach that's been used in other jurisdictions, but we have to manage congestion and carbon, and we have to take in a, into account what's happening in, their, in our region. Every year, more people from the city of Vancouver go out to suburban areas from work. Every year, we're growing our commute distances and our commute times. Our vehicle stock in the lower mainland is growing at twice the rate of our population. We need an approach to mobility pricing that turns these things around and really focuses growth, not just in Vancouver, but ma major nodes around the region. The vast majority of employment growth is happening 25 kilometers from downtown Vancouver in widely distributed areas. It isn't happening in focused areas. So a mobility pricing regime that has a cordon under around the downtown has huge implications to carbon and congestion but also low wage workforces and local businesses in downtown Vancouver. A huge in, outside the box opportunity is really thinking about a mobility pricing regime, regime that's distance paced, but starting on electric vehicles. Um, who's gonna resist? Uh, what kind of an electric vehicle owner is going to uh, uh, oppose mobility pricing? The vast majority of them are climate change supporters. 
Uh, final slide, back to the archway. I, one of the things that I really, really want to underscore is as we move under this archway uh, at Van Dusen Gardens and reflect on the milestones, some of the keystone principles that are critical to advancing some of our most important agendas. And one of them is imagination. We have to think outside the box. All too frequently, we're thinking, we're not even thinking inside the box. Inside the box is where the people are who are living in our buildings and they're not considered in most climate plans. The city of Vancouver turned that page and made people prominent in this plan. More has to be done to ensure that those people's interests are, are addressed. And the other is integration. We need not only a zero carbon plan, we need a zero poverty plan. We have a whole bunch of complex problems we're trying to solve. And the only way that we're gonna solve them is together. Okay, um, thank you very much, Alex. Um, and um, you know, something that I'm going to ask everyone at the end of this, in in my round of questions, is out of all of the the um, milestones uh, that were posed, that were um, proposed, or that you have in mind, which ones, which one do you think will really be around? in 2030, which will have had the most impact. But, so just ponder that. In the meantime, I'm gonna to go to Kamala Todd, who is not the Vice President of the United States. She has a much more important position here in Vancouver. Um, and um, Kamala was um, the city's uh, first Indigenous arts and culture planner. And before that, the Aboriginal social planner where she created Storyscapes and an Indigenous community arts and storytelling project um, to bring uh, greater recognition for the many stories um, in this region from the Musqueam, Squamish and tsleil um, and she is a Métis Cree community planner, um, educator, curator, filmmaker. Uh, it says here, born and raised in the beautiful lands of the word I cannot pronounce. I think it might be Halkomen uh, and Squamish speaking people. Uh, and you're an adjunct professor in SF at SFU. So um, really looking forward to your thoughts on these milestones or the missing ones. Thanks, Francis. Yeah, and actually I'm at UBC right now too, which is really nice to kind of experience the two different planning schools and approaches. Mm -hmm. um, thank you, Tonse everyone. Um, I'm Kamala Todd, uh, blessed to be born uh, and raised throughout these territories here. Right now I'm speaking to you from North Vancouver, um, really close to Tsleil-Waututh and Squamish uh, friends and neighbors. Um, but I'm not myself of these lands, even though I was born here, my children were born here. Um, my own ancestors are Cree and Métis from um, Red River settlement all the way west um, to various uh, Cree and Métis areas, including uh, St. Paul the Métis settlement. Um, and then my mother moved um, to Vancouver at a very young age. And she was always and continues to be very active in sort of native community as, as I know it and understand it. Um, so I've always had a very strong sense of being within an Indigenous community, but um, it took a long time for me to start to really know and understand the specificity of, of these lands and where I live and the names for the people and the languages that they speak and so on. So the Hunkaminam and Squamish languages of, of this place. And, and it's taking, you know, it's an ongoing journey for me within my own work and the way I live my life and the way I raise my children. Um, to, to practice my own cultural teachings of reciprocity and showing gratitude, um, to live by my own cultural teachings um, that I'm you know, learning now because of various forces of displacement um, of colonization, you know, being displaced from land, being displaced from language and so on. Um, a Cree concept of Wakotawin, which relates to um, you know, the idea of kinship and interrelation and the fact that we are all related um, and that includes every being on this planet. Um, and then trying to learn the teachings and the stories of these lands, um, being you know, fortunate to work with a lot of people from these lands and also you know, be um, friends and family with a lot of people from these lands. And so I'm thinking constantly um, about how to give back, to show my gratitude, to, to be responsible 
and accountable to these lands and their ancestors um, because I'm indebted to these lands. Um, these lands and waters and the people and the ancestors uh, have, have raised me. Um, and so um, my whole focus is about how to take good care of this place and how to help the rest of us really know this place. Because from my own work, um, and this is where I'm gonna go into territory that probably won't be very popular um, amongst the, the crowd today, um, but hopefully people were expecting this from me. Um, uh, but yeah, so my own work with the city of Vancouver on and off over the past 20 years, uh, basically fresh out of grad school where I was with Grant Duckworth actually in geography, um, got into social planning at a time when the city of Vancouver had zero right relationship, zero recognition of whose lands these are. And in fact, um, the website said that the people who used to live here were Haida. Um, there were very few, in, there were no in, dedicated indigenous staff positions, um, very few indigenous staff at the city. And anytime I would talk about working with the local nations whose lands these are, I was told, well, that's a federal issue. That's a treaty issue. Why would we work with the people on reserve. So there was very much this idea that Vancouver um, doesn't have, you know, is not an indigenous place, that anything indigenous is the reserve or, you know, out of the city, or it's the kind of inner city problematic urban indigenous community. And so it was a process over my time at the city to really help people understand that indigenous rights and title um, always exist. The Musqueam, Squamish, and tsleil tooth people have lived here since time immemorial, time out of mind, thousands of years, however you want to talk about it. Everybody has their own way of, of describing their history here and their relationships to their lands here and their origin stories. So as I've been learning, the people of these lands have origin stories that connect them to the literal land. So the mountains, the water, um, the land itself, and that their first ancestors come from this place. And so the depths of that, the depths of that relationship, the depths of that, um, that connection and that history. But again, my experience working in the city of Vancouver and then my experience over all these years being an avid reader of all the history books and all the different ways that Vancouver has talked about, it's very much been the same dominant colonial narrative that this place was either an empty land or a vast wilderness, hardly occupied, barely used, being underused. It was it was not recognized as a place um, with you know, pre-existing societies and civilizations who have their own um, laws and governance systems and knowledge systems and economies and planning traditions and all of that. Um, and so I have been witnessing and talking about and trying to address this this history of erasure, this history of of this you know the. Doctrine of Discovery, the Terra Nullius, it's all here. Vancouver is very much a product of that. Um, we basically have a history of white men coming, claiming the land, seeing these lands as free for the taking, dreaming about the future that they want to have here, um, dreaming about the, you know, the, the wealth and the resources that they want to extract and, and build a nation in their own image to, to serve their own objectives. And then the whole history of eradication and removal and, and violence um, that really shaped the making of Vancouver. So as much as we're in this time of reconciliation, you know, how much are we actually contending with that truth of that history, that the, the very basis of Vancouver is that, it, that the laws that were imposed here were, you know, foreign laws of the British system onto lands that already had laws, onto lands where the people you know, had been severely uh, impacted by smallpox and other diseases, residential school system, past system, potlatch laws, all of it. That's the basis of this place. Um, uh, and so we still have this tradition of the great white fathers, the proud pioneers being seen as the founders of this place, as the caretakers of this place and the, the decision makers. People could argue that that's shifted. We know better now, things have changed. Walk into City Hall, look at the wall of mayors that have been um, at the helm of City Hall over the years. And, and that will be one indication that things haven't changed. Um, but also from my own experience working at the City of Vancouver, um, the, the, the key here is that any kind of 
um, tweaking or new language or conversations are great, but there's still not a deepening into the truth of what this place is. There's still an acceptance of Vancouver with its charter that you know, was basically made up that the province said you can have the power to, to, to make decisions for this place, to tax, to make money off of the lands and resources, to do with as you please, basically, to make boundaries, to map it, to name it, and to build it according to colonial values and ideas of how to live on the land. We're still living with that. And any kind of, like I said, tweaking or adjustments or conversations that definitely are important and definitely are making change. Um, are still not going to that depth about, you know, um, the truth of how this place was made, the truth of the, whose lands it is. So my, my whole thing is I don't see it as Vancouver to which we add, you know, conversations and, and new communities and, and new um, publics and, you know, try to see things a little bit differently, including, you know, the year of reconciliation and so on. I see it as it's Musqueam, Squamish, and tsleil waututh lands. It's the lands of the Hunkaminam and Squamish languages. It's the lands of their laws and their traditions and their knowledge, um, and so on, of, over which Vancouver has been imposed. And so that's, the, that's where we need to get to. And reconciliation, definitely the, the priority of it is very clear when a crisis like COVID comes along. How, how much energy and focus is Vancouver putting onto those conversations? Is it just an add-on? Is it just a little thing that we do over here? Yes, people are trying to weave it throughout the work, but I would argue that we're still working with this, this idea of Vancouver as just a given. So all this chronology that you're mapping is like, well, this happened and then this happened and then this happened and this happened. Are we willing to actually think about, you know, by, by whose authority have we claimed the right to make decisions for these lands? By whose authority um, do we get to tell the story of this place and write our dreams onto this place? Sure, we're inviting people to be part of that, but the people who make the decisions to host Expo, to host the 2010 Olympics, to create the Vancouver plan, to do the Greenest City strategy, all of those decisions are made without the first people of these lands as part of that, or even as a power sharing, or even as you know, listening to, to their knowledge and their approaches to how to do planning on these lands. So basically my feeling is it, any of those uh, milestones, which are great to see, you know, all kinds of actions happening are still working within the system as it is. And I'm, I'm not really gonna believe in this fundamental change until we actually are willing to rethink and remake Vancouver. And we can, because it's only been a little while and that charter is not written in stone. So um, I just want to finish by saying um, that, you know, this is land and it's really, really great for all of us to think about how, how do we know this land? How do we care for this land? How do we make decisions for this land? And who is telling those stories? Because there is a specific language and knowledge and relationship that belongs here, that's always been here. And we need to address that erasure. And um, so I have other things that I can share about, about that in my own um, experience over the past year uh, while I was working at the city. Hi, hi, thank you. Um, thanks very much. I think that took us all onto another plane completely <laughs> of thinking about this. And I'm sure for the planning commission people thinking about how could we actually reframe the whole milestones conversation um, I mean, I know that there have been, uh, you know, increasingly uh, the milestones include things like the Sinoc development or, you know, the, the very important role of, of um, the Musqueam, Tsleil-Waututh and, and Squamish in developing different parts of Vancouver. Um, but what you're talking about is a real uh, reorientation of how you think about what Vancouver is uh, from the beginning and that all these milestones are really layered on a foundation that often doesn't get discussed. So a very big uh, concept, I think, for everyone here to think about. Um, okay, our final speaker, and then I'm gonna go after this, I think into um, some 
general questions because um, people are speaking for a fairly long time and the panelists are getting quite, uh, you know, quite a, a chance to speak here. And I, I know that there's some really passionate people in the audience. And I think I would like to move to questions from them, but it could also include questions or comments from the panelists to each other. So I'm kind of gonna do a free for all, if that's okay with everybody. Uh, but, but before that, we'll hear from Jesse Donaldson, who, um, now this is gonna really mark me as an old person, but I think Jesse is becoming the Chuck Davis. The new Chuck Davis. I've got the mustache. Uh, so anyone who actually gets that reference, you're old. Uh, <laughs> but anyway, um, yeah, Jesse's becoming like a, a chronicler of Vancouver history. Um, they only said here that you're an author, but I know that um, your first book was This Day in Vancouver, mm -hmm. I think. Yep. And then you wrote about um, Vancouver's prominent town fool. Yep. Um, your third book, uh, was uh, uh, which I've obviously read is about you know sort of the history of Vancouver's unsavory real estate uh, deals, um, and now and that was a that's part of a series, right? That, it is. Um, yeah. Yeah. Is going yeah. forward. So you might want to talk a bit more about that because I didn't yeah. get any information on it. But anyway, oh. Jesse is someone who knows the archives well um has plumbed a lot of vancouver history so for someone like him the milestone is uh placed in a different temporal context i would think actually yes. not quite as large as kamala's but <laughs> no, <laughs> no certainly not um i mean i that said i am used to looking a little bit further back than just last year <laughs> let's mm -hmm. put it that way so Forgive me if I'm a bit out of my depth there, but um, yeah, the series uh, is called 49.2 Tales from the Offbeat, and it's intended to be um, a series of shorter books um, that chronicle either basically just elements of city history that haven't been explored yet, and um, that will at some point, I hope, expand to include uh, pre-contact history, um, but also showcasing other other types of uh, voices once I, I'm, I'm writing the first few, and then I'm hopefully going to be turning that over to a lot of other voices, a lot of other storytellers um, to tell a lot of other kinds of stories uh, to just explore elements of city history that we haven't, elements, characters that haven't been explored yet. Um, and so, yeah, that's that's the hope moving forward. And um, yeah, uh, in terms of the milestones for the evening, I, I, I think I'm coming at this at, from kind of a similar place as Antonia. Um, so I'll try not to just repeat everything she said, but um, I definitely looking at the milestones. I was maybe a bit puzzled by some of them. Um, for for one, some of them seemed like you know repeats of the same thing. There was a lot of talk about public space, which is good. I mean, I I definitely like being able to drink in public, and uh, you know be able to ride my bike down the roads and not have to worry about you know automobile traffic or things like that. But um, there were others that I found a little bit more puzzling. You know, online city hall seems great, but you know. Um, it didn't seem necessarily like a milestone relative to some of the other things that made it on the list um, and some of the others that, that, that didn't. Um, and it was, it was interesting because to me, the ones that I thought were the most important in this, uh, in this whole discussion were the ones that ended up very close to the bottom in terms of just the amount of you know, votes that they received. Yeah. Uh, you know, and, the, and in particular, that was um, the temporary sex worker housing and, and the Hogan's Alley uh, uh, negotiations. Um, and I'm, I'm really, really interested to hear more actually about those, you know, about what that might look like um, in a Hogan's Alley Society sort of stewardship of that, that, that land. I hope that it can become something really transformative and interesting. Um, it just seemed like a lot of these milestones were more, let's say, aesthetic than social, maybe. And, you know, I know that addressing affordability isn't always intended to be part of the conversation because it's a broad ongoing issue, but it seemed like a few of these came off as maybe a bit tone deaf just because they weren't even viewing some of them through the broader context of affordability, which is of course as much a social issue as it is an economic issue because it disproportionately affects, you know, people of color, uh, you know, uh, and, and like uh, other you know, minorities and, and, you know, LGBTQ plus and all of that. So um, it, planning it seems is so you know it's about as much about quality of life as it is about the built form so the milestones those two in particular i thought were worth addressing because 
uh, putting to the top of the list rather than the bottom, just because they're the ones that are taking steps towards making a city that works for everybody. And as somebody who looks back through history a lot, I mean, there have been times in the past when, you know, all levels of government and, you know, people at all, all levels, the province, the federal government, the city planning departments, they've all had that goal at the same time, you know, to make a city that works for more people and addresses the needs of more people rather than, you know, necessarily richer people or people, you know, with, with development interests or things like that, the economically advantaged, let's say. Um, and when that happens, great things can, can happen in this city. It's, it's not impossible. Um, yet there's been a great many more instances when the needs of the economically advantage of maybe taking precedence over the needs of others. Um, and because we have such a finite amount of bandwidth in this, you know, in, in these meetings and finite amount of hours in the day, it seemed it would sort of behoove us to put our energy and priorities in the right place. Um, and so, yeah, to me, the, the temporary sex worker shelter and the, and the Huggins Alley negotiation seemed like the two that stood out above everything else because, I mean, any attention that could be paid to addressing historic injustices or helping to alleviate suffering for people in less fortunate circumstances, those to me are milestones. Those are things that I, I hope expand, continue, should be celebrated, should be elevated to the top of the pile. And that's not to say that the others aren't useful, I guess, but if we're talking, I just, yeah, in, in order of importance, I think that those are the kinds of things we need to be looking at more of moving forward in these kinds of milestone discussions. Um, okay, thanks. Um, and I, I'm not seeing any uh, questions from the audience yet. I think they might be trickling in slowly. Um, but I do want to ask you what I was mentioning earlier on, um, which is what that happened in 2020 of the changes that happened to the city, of the new movements, of the sort of reorganization of how we think of the city. Of all of those things in 2020, what is the thing that you think will, that we will remember in 2040, in, in 20 years from now? What'll be the one that has the impact and that's long lasting, if you had to name one thing from 2020? Go for it. I just wanted to quickly add what I what I what I think should be highlighted, and whether it's going to have that long term impact. I, that would be my hope. Um, and it, it, there is actually some questions going on in the Q and A tab there, and one of them was about this sort of learning that needs to happen around the roots of Vancouver, as they said. Um, so the the city actually passed the. Um, the heritage, the Vancouver Heritage Program in March, which was approved by council. And it's actually re re represents a very significant shift in heritage policy, whether that's actually gonna happen in, in, in reality. Um, the language there has a lot of potential to shift the sort of a lot of what I'm talking about, about what the story of Vancouver is, because um, that's where so much of the problem is, is we, we, we have all these lies and myths that we tell ourselves about what this place is. So the more that those stories are transformed, which also goes along with some cultural heritage work that is supposed to come out of the, the culture plan, which I worked on actually, which was approved in September, 2019. So that's another way that hopefully there'll be some shifts where the nations are gonna be funded um, to, if they want to do this, to share their own stories and histories and um, the ways that they want Vancouver to be known. And that can include the languages, the place names and the, that kind of thing. So there's a few areas of work that are gonna be going forward, but I think the heritage um, program was a, was a pretty significant shift um, that didn't get, isn't in the list. Mm -hmm. Others, the longest lasting, most impactful thing from 2020, even though I hate the word impactful. <laughs> Um, oh, uh, no, no, go ahead. No, no, um, no go ahead. I'll, I'll formulate my thought. Go ahead. Oh, okay. I mean, mine is really not that profound, but it, it seems like in so many ways, this has been a bit of a stasis year for a lot of, a, a lot of people. It's hard to, you know, because we don't, we don't quite know how even where things are going in a month. And so it's really, really, it's been difficult to figure out what the impact of something's going to be in 30 years when I'm not even sure what the impact is going to be <laughs> in a week. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Alex, I think you were gonna, or no, Antonia, you were gonna say something. Yeah, um, I'm gonna go out there and, and say um, 
uh, the um, virtual council meetings. It seems very mundane, but mundane, but it is truly a movement towards this kind of digital engagement, then that's where we're going. And I think we're going to see a lot more of an evolution around what that might look like. Um, there was a question in the chat. And so if you click on the answered ones, I said I would, I'd address it kind of verbally around how can we better engage youth in these types of planning discussions and reflections. And that's really meeting them where they're at. And that's meeting them online. And I think that that is um, a little bit of a, so it's, I think we're at a little watershed moment there in terms of creating greater access to City Hall in that way. Again, I mentioned around the digital divide was like on and front and center uh, during the pandemic on how people weren't actually able to engage, particularly youth as maybe they're in a house, they have siblings, they all share one laptop or a parent was using the laptop. Um, so they wouldn't even have access to technology. I mean, I'm working with young people that are using internet in the Tim Hortons. Like, so uh, I think that uh, this is going to be a really interesting, it's a really interesting move for the city. Um, and that this is kind of the beginning of, of what it will um, look like. And, uh, and again, addressing that question around engaging youth, meeting them online, as well as um, co-creation. I think there will be a, a, a movement towards co-creation and engaging young people more, less in terms of a feedback or focus group scenario. I think young people are currently building worlds. They built worlds in Ethos Lab that they are, they, there are imaginations that are, um, and they're having these conversations around is Vancouver a given as well? Um, and they want to have these conversations. It's just that the current mechanisms that are in place have not been as accessible. So I think that this digital interface is kind of the little gem that might be able to have young people be more engaged and creatively inclined to in, in get, get online. Um, I think we just need to enhance the UX and UI <laughs> of it. To, yeah. to I mean, I have to say, as someone who has covered, I can't even think of how many public hearings and council meetings um, since 1994, and seen who typically comes out in person to those meetings, um, it was just an incredible sea change for me to listen to the different voices. And I totally get that there's still people excluded, um, but it was still so much broader a range than what you normally see. I mean, one meeting, uh, there were 10 or 15 people gathered around a cell phone somewhere near Strathcona Park who were, um, you know, sharing the phone and providing their comments to council as council was deciding what to do about Strathcona Park. And there was an immigrant mom from Yale Town who I am 100% certain would never have come down to City Hall and sat there for four hours to wait to say her five minute piece. One hundred, Yeah, and so there could definitely be an improvement and I'm sure that's the kind of thing you're working on. Um, but for me, it was a revelation to hear these new voices. So yeah, I, I, I guess I kind of agree with you <laughs> in that one. Um, but uh, Alex, what would you, what are you thinking out of everything we're talking about here on the list or off the list? In 2040, what will we look back and say, Vancouver changed in this way? The, the city has quite a strong active travel mode share and people use public spaces but I would say that this is really a watershed moment in which people came out into the streets and sidewalks in droves due to a public policy response by the city to create more opportunity. And, you know, the transformation of, of parklets. Um, and I think this is something that could be pretty transformative. It certainly relates to the importance in the Climate Emergency Act, Act, uh, Action Plan of our 15-minute neighborhoods, um, which, which is so central, shifting a, a much larger share of our, uh, our trips onto foot and on bike. But I think this is a really important one, and it's, it's not new, but it, it is transformative, just the degree to which it happened. Yeah, I mean, I'd love to hear other people weigh in, but um, I mean, and I know there is the critique that the whole 
parklet patio thing benefited a particular class and particular areas of town. So, but that aside, I felt like some parts of that worked and the slow streets movement didn't, you know, it's just now there's a bunch of orange plastic all over the streets and everyone's still driving exactly the same way they did before. Um, but uh, yeah, um, uh, it'll be interesting to see what of those changes stay uh, for sure. Um, there is a question from the somewhat Carrie Thompson in the audience, and we haven't really talked about this. It's usually a staple of how is the city changing, but Vancouver is different, so we don't always do this. But um, someone was asking, is there a, pro a development project, a building, um, a space that was either approved or constructed in 2020 that seems like it's, um, you know, sort of a city landmark? Anybody? I just responded now. Um, <laughs> just um, there's a really amazing vision for a project um, from 52 to 92 East Hastings. It's called the Aboriginal Land Trust, and it's a partnership with um, Native Health. Um, I think Lumen Native Housing or Vancouver Native Housing. I forget. I think maybe both. Um, and it's like a hub model. It's going to be a space that really um, is a holistic, you know, shaped by Indigenous teachings around caring for each other. And Chief Ian Campbell, who spoke last year, um, wrote the statement of significance, which was done in a completely different way. He talked about, you know, ancestral and, and history and origin stories and supernatural beings all the way up until today. And they have an um, Aboriginal woman on the um, architect texture team and Deborah Sparrow's weaving designs are going to be woven into the building itself. Um, so I think that the vision is really beautiful and the, and the approach is, is quite transformative. And Could hopefully- Just remind us what block that is? Um, 52, 52 to 92 East Hastings. So just one block east of Woodward's or? Um, yeah, so the, it's called the Sheldon. It's like- um, Oh, right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right by the Belmoral there. I hadn't, I, you know, I hadn't even heard of that. That's really interesting. It's a very inspiring model. <laughs> mm -hmm. Oh, thanks. I think, um, I think that's illuminating for a lot of people. Others, a, a specific building or park project or something physical, tangible. No, no <laughs> Vancouver house. No mm -hmm. park with uh, treetop walks. Oh, the chandelier, but that was last year or the year before. Um, yeah, there, ha I, there hasn't been a big significant um, piece of public art, uh, I don't think. And I mean, I think for some people, the most uh, striking thing was the possibility that the Trump Tower sign might be removed. Mm -hmm. So, <laughs> uh, but it hasn't happened yet. Um, Okay, anyone else? Uh, any other kind of landmark thing, Antonia or um, no? I didn't have any necessarily landmark things and I feel I'm just gonna say something, um, but around um, Georgia and uh, Cardero, all of those towers, like they'd all been slated for development um, are, are, are all really coming up now. Um, I think that in terms of, again, it's just, it speaks to that affordable housing um, issue. Just now they're all starting to come to fruition. And so I think they're less of, these are like landmark pieces that um, that uh, uh, are of any particular uh, significance as as the architectural piece, but more of, it just feels like a landmark of of the decisions that have been made or were made and and uh, what and and now they're kind of physically manifesting to be seen in front of the co-op that's on Cardero as well to see this these tall towers. So um, that's just that I'm I was just starting to notice that um, yeah. there uh, have been some big ones going up. Yeah, for sure. Um, I just looked at my schedule. One, one, oh, sorry. One, Go ahead. One one big development, I, I think it was this, it, it just might not have hit 2020, but it, I think the move in happened in 2020 was the Vancouver Fire Hall number five that was that had social housing integrated. Yeah. Into it. That was that was that was mid December um, or something like that. But I think the move in happened in January. And that's a phenomenal demonstration 
of really effectively making use of underutilized public space. And we just have to do more of it. And there's so many of these untapped opportunities uh, that we can uh, advance affordable housing in one form or another. Yeah, no, no, that's, uh, you know, it's uh, the, the kind of thing that's small and often goes unnoticed. I, I mean, we wrote about it when they were proposing it, and then when it actually opened, hardly anyone covered it. And, and you forget that those kinds of interesting things are going on in Vancouver. I mean, the same with the Strathcona Library earlier um, with social housing above it. Um, okay, um, I am being told to wrap up. Uh, so now you each get one minute for one more comment, everyone on the panel, something that got totally left out, something that you just have to respond to that another person said, what you think the milestone for 2021 will be, whatever you want, go ahead. And I'll go in reverse uh, from where I started. So Jesse first. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the one thing that, I mean, this is more just an open question. I'm really curious about what's gonna happen with rental only zoning. It's something that just didn't get mentioned. I know it was implemented this year, but then nothing kind of happened with it project-wise. But I'm, it's, it, it seems like there's been. Did you say rental only zoning? Rental only zoning, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and it's it's been tried uh, once in New West, and there's been a whole bunch of legal drama mm-hmm. around it. But it's 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 this thing that I really wanted. I'm curious to keep an eye on because it could have the potential to be quite transformative, or it could have the potential to go absolutely nowhere. It's it's. Um, I mean, I know what I'm hoping, but I, that's just something that I think was interesting. And I wondered why it hadn't really merited any sort of, even just a note. I mean, other than that, it hasn't been tried yet, but just because mm-hmm. it is such a, it is such a big question mark. And that's something yeah, that Yeah, because it could have, a, a milestone could have been, um, you know, the, the city planners did come up with something that was uh, intended to pro- um, provide a lot more rental, like have transition zones, off of arterials and things like that. And it kind of got lost in the pandemic. Like I wrote a story about it in one of the last public houses, open houses I was allowed to go to. And um, and, and yeah. then it's kind of disappeared, you're right. Yeah, it just kind of got swallowed up and I'm interested to see yeah. how it reemerges. Yeah, Kamala, K- Kamala. Um. I like this uh, just food for thought. So again, just encouraging everyone who is not uh, dis- descended from this this land to think about our relationship to this place and um, our accountability. And I love this quote from Jeanette Armstrong, the Okanagan writer and educator. The land as language surrounds us completely, just like the physical reality of it surrounds us. Within that vast speaking, both externally and internally, we as human beings are an inextricable part, though a minute part, of the land language. And all Indigenous people's languages are generated by a precise geography and arise from it. So thinking about the land language, what is the story that Vancouver currently uh, communicates and, and what we tell ourselves as decision makers or um, you know, authors, um, who gets to be the author of the city and you know, what will the stories and the land language of this place be? And hopefully with all the changes and, and awareness that's happening, um, you know, we'll be much more truthful about those stories and then that will be reflected in, in how we live here and how we make decisions for this place. Hi, hi. I, think, I think we're going to nominate you as the anti-Harlan Bartholomew. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. um, okay, Alex. Okay. You know, for me, uh, I think one of the most important uh, developments in the past year is, is not something that we can touch and feel, but affects us profoundly. And that's this, um, I say, data-based dynamic policy pay- making that happens so rapidly that and a willingness and a, and a desire and a need for big course corrections by policymakers locally, provincially, uh, federally. And it's really refreshing to see and that you, you underscored it, um, Francis, that you know, not everything has been successful. It never is but accepting that we're gonna actually make lots of mistakes and make failures, but it's important to make decisions. And, you know, we'd spend so much time studying things, 
we really have to move forward to address so many of these big complex problems. And I, I hope that you know, data-based, hopefully even better data-based data uh, decision-making that's dynamic and rapid is something that's done uh, much more uh, boldly in the future. Mm -hmm. Sort of like the pandemic. We're constantly getting new streams of data that's altering how we think we should handle yeah. it. Yeah. Um, Antonia. Yeah, I'm going to say two very quick things. Um, the uh, I, I wanted to reflect on the future, and I definitely see that intersection of, again of the digital reality and the physical reality being something that's going to come into play. And um, I, I again kind of responding to the question in the middle of the pandemic, we asked the young people, "What does a digital community look like?" And they came up with a virtual reality environment, and we shared it with the Vancouver Vancouver planning. We, uh, they presented to Gill, and was completely amazed at what the young people had come up with. So I'm really interested in really em empowering young people to be co-creators and builders of the future, um, and leveraging uh, these tools around technology. So I think smart cities are going to look a lot different from what we understand it to be. And then um, I, I, I think I com completely agree with Kamala around um, the store, I guess the stories we tell. And um, when I, I look at Black Lives Matter, I, and again, Black Lives Matter in planning, that this, um, it, sh it must be on the tape. We need to reconcile with, with the nature of, of white supremacy that has been embedded in the planning process. And that this is a conversation that isn't just now, you know, that has just started, it has been going on. Um, and, um, and this is, I, I have, I hold a lot of hope for the future and the young people addressing these issues as we listen to them, that um, I hope that this is still on the table next year. Great. Well, I think that this has set the stage for an interesting maybe rethink of how to do milestones in 2021. Um, I see a note in chat that says Gordon Price has his hand raised. I don't see a question. I don't know what to do about that. Um, so I think I am going to pass the baton to Karen Krangle, who's going to wrap up our evening here. Uh, Karen, my former Vancouver Sun colleague who's on the Planning Commission, uh, and I hope you're there and ready to take it I'm, away. I'm here, I am. You okay. can hear me. Okay, yes. thanks, Francis. Uh, that was a really fascinating discussion. It was uh, every, every year um, when we have our year in review, uh, it, we have a different kind of panel and we have a different kind of discussion on this. And of course, it was such a different year too. Uh, this was great. And thanks, Francis, for your skillful moderation and great introduction to the milestones and the panelists. And thanks to the panelists for adding new dimensions to the milestones and the chronology, giving us lots of food for thought. Um, in recognition of your time and knowledge, the VCPC will be donating $50 in each of your names to the, Ur the Na Urban Native Youth Association. Excuse me. Thanks, too, to everyone for attending and for the question about a 2020 landmark. Somehow just Beach Avenue keeps popping up in my mind, but um, I, guess, uh, I guess we all have different ideas of, uh, of what, what, uh, what marked 2020. Um, one aspect of identifying truly transformative mile, milestones is how they resonate with the public. And uh, as always, um, your, the discussion uh, definitely uh, provided us with lots of ideas. Um, and Jesse, uh, sometimes even our committee is, is puzzled by some of the milestones, but we put them out there for discussion anyway. Um, we'll now get to work on finalizing um, the, uh, the list of 2020 emerging milestones, and, and we'll be adding them to our planning chronology to review again in five years um, to see how they stood up. Um, as you can imagine, a lot of work has gone into the chronology project to get it where it is today. Um, and, uh, but, and we couldn't do it without the help of our volunteers. And if, any, if you had fun tonight, and if anyone is interested in joining us, um, just, uh, just uh, there's plenty of opportunities. Just talk to Yuri or um, contact one of our chronology members who are here tonight. Um, Yuri's email will be posted in, in the chat if you're interested in 
joining the committee. And of course, if you're interested in joining the commission, um, the city will soon be posting opportunities for people to apply for committees, including the commission. Thank you and um, have, a, have a great evening.